My name is Christian Ashley, a seminary student and servant of God, and you are listening to the Let Nothing Move You podcast, a proud Anazal Ministries podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to the next episode of the Let Nothing Move You podcast. I'm your host, Christian Ashley, as we continue on through the book of Exodus, about to be in the book of, Levitic- of Leviticus. I'm looking forward to it. As mentioned before, we have some returning guests on the show. It's going to be a really fun time. I, in, in a book that, like we've discussed earlier, I'm not normally that keen on, but as I've already studied a little in advance, there are some things that I missed the past couple of times I've read. So I'm looking forward to going over that with all of you and for having other voices with me in that, pro- uh, is that problem. That's the wrong way to put that uh, in that biblical text. <laughs> so Freudian slip there. All right. So guys, uh, there's something new. Uh, and as our ministries podcast network, we're always growing. We have a new show uh, about to be released in a, couple of weeks if i recall correctly maybe by the end of the month uh some joyful noises this is a kind of an experimental podcast where there is no singular host it is basically a group of people across the network and maybe even some guests from elsewhere just discussing music and that could be christian music could be something else me uh, i will be focusing uh periodically you know, whenever I feel like it, on reviewing some songs uh, that I do really love. I'll be starting with my favorite song of all time, which is Jesus Freak by DC Talk. And I'm sure none of you are surprised by that revelation. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to it, having a bunch of fun with it. And there's going to be plenty of other people uh, that you can hear their voices and their tastes and music and stuff like that. So that's some joyful noises. I'll try and be better about actually letting you know when it's coming out. And speaking of things that have come out, Friday Night Frights has come out in podcast form. Uh, We have the last month's recording that Joe and I did. So go out and subscribe to that as well. And I think that's it for bookkeeping. It's time to go to Exodus 30 through 32, starting in verses 1 through 10. You shall make an altar on which to burn incense. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its breadth. It shall be square, and two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be of one piece with it. You shall overlay it with pure gold, its top, and around its sides, and its horns, not thorns. (laughs) And you shall make a molding of gold around it. And you shall make two golden rings for it. Under its molding, on two opposite sides of it, you shall make them, and they shall be holders for poles from which to carry it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it in front of the veil that is above the ark of the testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony where I will meet with you. And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it, a regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer unauthorized incense on it or a burnt offering or a grain offering, and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. With the blood of the sin offering of atonement, he shall make atonement for it once in a year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. Now, what we have here, this altar of incense, because it will serve in the most holy place, the altar is made out of gold, but it is placed before the veil separating it from the Ark of Testimony. Even though the two will never see one another in this way, they still serve useful functions that augment each other. This is done, of course, for the sake of the people. These specific instructions given so that when these specific things are done, God's wrath is satisfied for the moment. Now, as well, we see here that unauthorized or strange incenses were never to be used in these rituals. Now, there is nothing inherently wrong with the incense in question, but what was evil was for the incense to be used in ways it was not intended for. God demanded perfection, and to deviate from that made that person guilty of not treating God as seriously as he deserved. And we go from there to verses 11 through 16. The Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. 
Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is twenty geras. Half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from twenty years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel. When you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives, you shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting, that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. Now, this inflation-free tax offering is separate from regular tithing. It is intended to be a ransom paid by the Jews to God as a means for them to recognize that they owe their lives to him alone. It's a very symbolic way of doing that. God has purchased them from the world, it's kept them separate. So God is owed something from that. And a way they can pay him back is to pay his priests so that they can get their jobs done. And this, once again, is separate from regular tithing. This is something that everyone has to do for themselves. It's actually paying a ransom, separate from tithing. Now, the command for this to be done as a ransom also makes this about Israel's dependence upon God when they increase in numbers when the land is theirs, rather than their own strength. Now, later on, we will see King David fall into the trap of trusting in numbers rather than God in 2 Samuel 24 and its parallel account in 1 Chronicles 21. Once again, the censuses themselves were not evil. You need to know how many people are in the land. You need to know who's paying their taxes. You need to know who needs to make restitution for their sins by using the sacrificial system. Those are things you need to know. But relying on those censuses to say, okay, we've got this many able fighting men, instead of trusting in the God who can preserve them, which would be David's sin later on, will cause the plague that God mentions here. And from there, we shall go to verses 17 through 38. The Lord said to Moses, you shall also make a basin of bronze which, with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it, with which Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister to a burn of food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. They shall wash with their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. The Lord said to Moses, Take the finest spices of liquid myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet-selling cinnamon, half as much, that is 250 and 250 of aromatic cane, and 500 of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of olive oil. And you shall, excuse me, and you shall make of these a sacred oil, anointing oil, blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of testimony, and the table and all its utensils, and the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stand. You shall consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them will become holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. And you shall say to the people of Israel, This shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person, and you shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, shall be cut off from his people. The Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, stockta and onika and galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense of each shall there be an equal part, and make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, Pure and holy, you shall beat it some of it very small, and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you. And the incense that you shall make according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves, it shall be for you holy to the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to use this perfume shall be cut off from his people. As has been mentioned several times before, as will continually be mentioned throughout the Pentateuch. God's priests were to be clean, 
both inside and outside. By washing in the basin, they were ceremonially confirming they were holy clean. They were excuse me, clean. They were able to do the job and a task that God had gave them to do because their hearts were set on him. This wasn't offered to everyone else, not because they didn't need to be clean, but because the ones leading them needed to be set apart. Now, this applies to us as well, both physically and spiritually. We have been wiped clean by Jesus, thanks to his sacrifice, assuming that we have accepted the offer to repent of our sins and to then turn to him. We can only be in the presence of a holy, just, and perfect God if we ourselves are completely clean, which is something we can never do on our own. And this sacrificial system couldn't even offer that either. But it could offer the template for Jesus' sacrifice. It could offer the beginnings of understanding for what needed to happen for our sins to be washed away permanently by the blood of the Lamb. And without this setup, it doesn't make as much sense. Yeah, God still could have done what he did through Jesus' sacrifice. But we lose a lot of understanding without this system in place. And we go from there to chapter 31, verses 1 through 11. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, and cunning stones for setting, and in carving wood, to a work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Oholiab, the son of Aham, excuse me, Ahi Samak, of the tribe of Dan. And I have given all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you, the testimony of meeting and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is on it and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils and a pure lampstand with all its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin and its stand and the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron, the priest and the garments of his sons for their service as priests and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place. According to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. Now we see here two men brought up, have not appeared before this in the narrative, outside of being part of the collective group of Israel. There's nothing particularly special about them, except for the skill and the skills that God has blessedly gifted them with, as well as the heart for service that they must have for the sake of the people. Because of their devotion, the people of Israel were blessed for centuries by the presence of the things they built at this point in time in history, whether it's the 1400s or 1200s, whenever, doesn't matter. They did the job and the Israelites were blessed because they remained behind as a testament of them working alongside God for the purpose of bringing the people into worship with God. So too, are people blessed for countless centuries by the righteous skills and action that we have? We don't know when the end of the world is coming. If you believe certain people, we don't have much longer. It could be thousands of years. It could be hundreds of years. It could be tomorrow to set up the seven year of the end of the world. I don't know. But what I do know is as an example of men like this, we need to recognize what gifts we have and what we do to help build the church far beyond where people have forgotten our names. How many times have you heard someone in the church mention either one of these men? I'm guessing very few, if at all. But their names are recorded here to let us know who's responsible for actually bringing into life what God has commanded Moses to bring to the people. And look, there are plenty of people out there whose names we will never know who spent their time ministering to the poor, to the widow, to the orphan, to those in prison. We don't know their names. But the people who were with them no, and were encouraged by them, may have come to faith because of their actions. 
And as a result, our entire world has changed, whether we recognize it or not, because of the actions of people who were simply being faithful to Christ, being faithful to his words, that we now live in an unbroken chain of Christians who were faithfully living out their mission to love God and to love their neighbor as their self. Have you ever recognized that? I know I've gone over this before. I can't remember when, but you and I are part of that unbroken chain from Jesus's ministry to the 12 apostles and beyond. We are the result of that. You didn't just show up out of a vacuum. Something had to be done by someone on this earth imbued with the spirit of God to bring you to faith, to bring you to him. And we have that same ability, that same responsibility to go and do it for others. That is, that is an immense task. But take heart, because you're not going to be the one who screws it up for everyone. You're not. God is still going to work with you. He's still going to work with me. And he's going to bring us both to where we need to be to continue his kingdom in whatever ways he has. Chances are. Some of you may never bring someone to faith, and that's okay. That's not what God is saying. What he is saying is for you to be faithful. And that faithfulness will encourage someone else who is talking to someone that they can lead to faith or who is ministering to people in prison or what have you. Just be faithful like these men were faithful, and this world is going to be a whole lot better than what it could be. And you will never know the impact that you have until it's our time. And then when God chooses to reveal, so he will show us because of your actions, this happened. Because of your actions, this person came to faith and they never once heard your name. But maybe you gave enough money to a cause and it helped a missionary or maybe it helped with disaster relief or what have you. But we don't know because we are limited, finite, mortal beings. But our impact is far beyond what we could ever think. Our impact is eternal. This men, these men's impacts were eternal. And with that, we'll go to verses 12 through 18. And the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of holy rest, excuse me, a solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of gold. It's going to be skinny. Gosh, I am on a roll today with how bad my, my words are. Tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Keeping the Sabbath should have been a sign that the people were committed to God. Because it took effort to follow through with the command, denying its importance by working on it or simply going through the motions was sinful and evil because the Sabbath was there to remind the people of God's love for them as he allowed them to rest and be spiritually cared for. But it was also never meant to replace loving others. It was never meant to focus on yourselves fully. It was meant for self-reflection. It was meant to be, make yourself right with God. But there are things it was never meant to be. And as we go into Scripture further on in the New Testament, in the book of Mark, we see Mark 3, verses 1 through 6 in the NLT, the story of Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? 
but they wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once, the Pharisees went away enough to the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. Can we see very different takes on the Sabbath here? As are built up by verses like this. Pharisaical way of looking, don't do any work at all. Even if that work would cause God's kingdom to be furthered. Forgetting, by the way, that the priests had to work on the Sabbath in order to fulfill the needs of the people, the spiritual needs of the people, by preaching the word, by reminding them of the laws they were supposed to be doing. Then we have Jesus. What is the purpose of the Sabbath? The Sabbath is a day of rest and reflection and looking at God and no knowing his wondrous power so that we can bring that into the world. And he brings it into the world by healing this man. But the Pharisees couldn't take that because it took away power from them. Say, oh, well, I'm following the law. Why shouldn't you? Well, that's the law of their own self-creation. Versus this law here of someone, hey, if you work on the Sabbath, you're to be put to death. Because you were putting your needs above, excuse me, your desires and wants over what you needed, which is to get right with God. Look, that same directive to love others, even on the Sabbath, continues to this day, and we must be ready to serve when the opportunity arrives and to serve ourselves by worshiping God with a loving heart. Not taking the time to worship God on Sunday is a denial of our trust in Him, whether we're traveling, deciding to sleep in, or going to church and not paying attention. We chose Sundays to worship because that is the day Jesus resurrected following his death on the cross. But that does not mean we only worship him on Sunday. Let me make that perfectly clear. I have been personally convicted of this. Alongside how I approach his word, these are two separate issues I've been personally convicted on both. I need to have a better heart when worshiping, whether it be Sunday or whenever my heart stirred to worship him. I'm bad at it. There are some Sundays I show up and I go through the motions. And if a lot of Christians were a bit more honest about that, I think we could get some work done. Because instead of being passive about it, we need to do something about it. I need to be better. So yes, hey, there have been Sundays out there where I've been traveling, I've been on the road, or I've been sick, and I can't go anywhere. And what do I do with my time? Am I listening to some good music? Am I getting into the Word when I eventually reach the places I'm going to? and Resting? Or am I saying, well, didn't have to go to church today. I can do whatever the heck I want. Because that's been something I've done more times than I want to admit. And that is evil. That is a denial of why we have a day of rest like Sunday. And we are immensely, we should be immensely grateful. We have two in honor of the original Sabbath on Saturday and the new Sabbath on Sunday. Now, I've also in the midst of this, been personally convicted of how I approach God's Word. I have been challenged by a professor without him realizing he was challenging me, I'm fairly certain, about how I make these chapters applicable to you, as it helps connect you to understand Scripture better when I make them as close to your life experience as possible, without making things up for the sake of an easier-to-understand application. Look, I think I've done a good enough job sometimes, and saying, hey, here's how it applies. Here's how we should do things. But I haven't been good enough. And like, go, especially going through verses like these, where our tendency is to like tune out and go, okay, I don't really care about who makes the, the buildings or whatever. It's like, okay, yeah, there's it's this many, you know, whatever spices. And, you know, the colors have to be like this for the robes. Like, we need to focus. And I need to be able to better apply that to your own lives. And that's why I'm, I am struggling to do well, and I'm working on being better about that. Because if I don't reach you in that manner, I've lost you. And I don't want to lose you. Just as much as I don't want to be in a church service where the pastor or guest speaker or whatever is going over a verse of scripture, and it has nothing to do with what's going on, or there's no personal application to me. It's just, well, yeah, it's good that, you know, David slew Goliath again, but what does that mean for me? So that's something I've been thinking about, about how to be better about that. Now, continuing through here, God gave a physical tablet to Moses to help the people 
remember his words. The tablets would serve to be a physical reminder of the law given for their sake. Now, we live in a blessed age when it comes to our ability to access and study the word. These people did not. This is the introduction. 15th century, 13th century, whenever this is happening, this is the introduction of the code that they are to be following, built upon those Ten Commandments and more. For their sake, as Moses is writing these things down, guess what they don't have? The Internet. Guess what they don't have? A lot of books. The Jewish people had a very finite set of resources that they could learn from. That's why it was highly praised to be someone who could recount these things orally without error. Because the resources simply weren't there for everyone to have every bit of the law written down for them. So the priests needed to memorize them because, hey, we've got the main source here. We've got what Moses written, wrote down. But we don't have enough resources. We don't have enough money to make sure that everyone, every priest in the nation of Israel, which, by the way, the tribe of Levi, thousands upon thousands of members in it, didn't have access to those records. And, of course, the people didn't have it. Because if the priest can't even get it, they wouldn't have it. Outside of the select few who had the original text, they needed someone to remember it for them. We, on the other hand, have no excuse if we live in a technologically stable nation. Now, chances are, if you're listening to this, that applies to you. There may be circumstances out there where it's possible if you'd have access to this but not have readily access to everything else. I'm not going to say it's your fault, but I am going to say to especially my American and European uh, and parts of Asia audience, we don't have an excuse when it comes to accessing the word. We have so many different translations. And for those of you who want to study deeper, who actually care about the Hebrew and Greek, we have access to that too. For us not to utilize these amazing powers that we have is to spit in the face of those in the past who would gladly trade places with us to know Scripture in its entirety so that their worship could increase. I'm not trying to drag you down here. I'm not trying to say you're evil and worthless. I'm saying I am among you as someone who does not take Scripture as seriously as it should be at times because I get complacent. Because I think, oh, well, someone else will figure it out. Or I read, I read the Bible yesterday. I don't need to read it again. No, that is antithetical to who we're supposed to be with the resources we have at hand. You know, Jewish farmer who you know has to go to the temple or tabernacle every now and then to go get his sins covered by the blood of lambs and the birds and so on and so forth. That same person doesn't have access to the same scripture you and I have. But don't you think he would want it? Don't you think he would desire that? And yet we have it in front of us and we go, well, I have other things to do. I got a new video game to play, you know, oh, this new this new drama on TV or I got to hang out with my friends at some point in time. Yeah, those things aren't evil in and of themselves. But it's when we let them distract us from what we're supposed to be doing here that they become a problem. And just look at history. Even when the church was around, even when it was more readily available, not to everyone could have access to it. Gutenberg Press didn't get invented until what, the 1400s? Yeah. Uh, maybe 1500s. Sorry. Should have known that before I said anything. But for centuries, Regular attendees of Catholic Orthodox services, Cop Coptic services, and then later on even Protestant services didn't have access to this. And for the people in Greek, Coptic, Orthodox, excuse me, uh, Orthodox, Catholic, Coptic churches didn't even hear it in the language that they spoke. There was no service in Hungarian. There was no service in Italian. There was no service in English. It was Latin. So your podunk peasant who has no Latin training, well, yes, yeah, Scripture is being read to you, but you don't understand it. 
And most of these people never had the ability to read or have a physical Bible in their, in their possession. And in our current age, there are many Christians who live in countries where the gospel is against the law and don't have access to the Bible, because to do so and to be found out would mean death. Now, once again, I'm saying this not to shame you, but to remind you of the bounty that we have so that we can utilize it to its full potential. This is a good thing to have access to this. So use it. It's like having the cure to a disease in your hands and deciding, well, I took the pill yesterday. Do I really need to take it today? Yes. Yes, we do. And we'll go from there to chapter 32, verses 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, guys, shut up. You're doing the wrong thing. Nope. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in, the, in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and they received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. For hundreds of years, the Israelites had lived in a culture that worshipped multiple gods, and it shows by their actions. God alone had delivered them from Egypt and their gods, but in the absence of Moses, they faltered. Not eight chapters ago, they had said in Exodus 24-3 in the NIV, when Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. What was one of the things that had been brought down before this moment? Oh, by the Ten Commandments. He shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. Everything the Lord has said we will do, said the people of Israel, said the people of the church right now. <laughs> now look at them breaking both the first and second commandment. What happened? They allowed distance, time, and pride to let their hearts wander. God had never promised them to physically appear and speak with them every single day. But the idols of Egypt did. So the people asked Aaron to, to add these calf idols to the list of what they worshipped, and he complied like a coward, which... By the way, if you recall your earlier exodus, if this is the middle of the day, what should the people be seeing around their camp? A pillar of smoke and cloud, which has been there every single day, which has been what has been providing them with food. The, there's a presence of God there. They're looking at it. But Moses is gone, so I don't know. I don't know about all this. And, and if it just happens that they're having this discussion in the middle of the night, well, what's surrounding their camp? A pillar of fire that should not exist in this world without a supernatural influence. And yet, well, Moses isn't here. So I guess uh, guess we gotta got to move on. Got to make a new God for ourselves. Like, the sheer ridiculousness of this is something you want to get angry at them for. But then you realize we're just as bad. Yeah. I don't have a pillar of smoke around me during the day. I don't have a pillar of fire at night. But I have had the multiple times over in my life where I have been saved from things that I rightfully should have died to or rightfully should have lost friends and family to because of my actions. And yet he stepped in and intervened. And yet he came in and gave me life where there was none in me. And then I wander over to these different sins and make them an idol, and pursue them instead. How does that happen? Distance, time, and pride. Distance from the events where God saved us, distance from the time when they happen, and our own personal pride that says, I know what I'm doing. I don't have to listen to what God has to say. I know what's best for me. 
Now, Aaron, I called him a coward. Some of you maybe guess up that I'd say you're in the wrong. Aaron's role was to be the high priest, leading the people into proper worship of God. He is extremely fortunate that God still has designs for him to become that high priest. Otherwise, he would have suffered the same fate as thousands of his own people will later on in this chapter. But even with that in mind, that God is going to preserve him here, this doesn't excuse him or his actions simply because God still had use for him. Just because God has use for you doesn't mean he's okay with everything you've done. He didn't go to Saul after you know persecuting Christians and going, man, Saul, man, should have been doing that. But I got plans for you. It's all good. No, he punished him. And then when Saul came to faith, also called Paul, God worked with him because God had plans for him. Despite the sin of his past, God forgave because Saul asked for forgiveness. Because Saul knew what he was supposed to be doing. Now, Aaron doesn't make that proclamation of God forgive me. But by his actions later on, for the most part, we can see his faithfulness towards God through the rest of the Pentateuch until his death before he can enter the promised land. By the way, a punishment for not following through with God, for not believing in God, for not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Aaron's sins are cowardice and foolishness, as he should have talked the people down from this moment and denied them their folly. That's his job. Yet, when faced with peer pressure and far larger numbers, he caved and balked at his sacred duties and made a mockery of God's commands just to placate a restless people who should have known better, talking to someone who should have known better. This same Aaron had been the one who had worked alongside his brother Moses to bring the plagues and judgments upon Egypt, and now he was acting as if it had never happened. So too were the people doing that. But you would think the someone who was personally involved would have had more of a backbone about this, and yet he doesn't. Now, leaders, good leaders, no matter how small they are in their leadership roles, whether it's the pastor of a church, leader of a diocese, from the pope, all the way down to you know, a preschool leader, or wherever you lead, because guess what? Everyone leads something. They never back down from the truth simply to save their own skins and placate the masses if they're doing their job. Good leaders fight even when every other voice says something different, whether that be in the church, culture, or global affairs. There's a reason this podcast is named Let Nothing Move You. You know why? Because there are things out there that are heresy. There are things out there that are sinful. There are things out there that do not belong in the church, and we cannot move from truth to allow them in. It is evil to do so. It is sinful to do so. It is harmful to do so. And we are better off standing firm, even if it means we lose jobs, even if it means that we lose friends or what have you, because we stood by truth and God is going to remember that in the end. Yeah, there are plenty of people out there who stood by truth and were slandered for it or hurt for it, exiled for it. And yet, in light of eternity, who do you think is going to get praised? The person who persecuted? The one who stood by truth? Or the person who remained steadfast to God? We think too often in our temporal existences and our mortal existences of what's happening right now. But it's far better to think in a more eternal perspective. Yeah, I don't like suffering. I don't want to be the person who does. But it is far better for me to suffer temporarily in a small grand scheme of things, however long I live on this earth, compared to the light of eternity. Truth remains truth no matter how many people group up against it. Popular opinion does not make something truth. Appealing to authority does not make something truth unless that authority is truth. The Bible is truth. You can look at that as authority. You can also listen to the episode that Joshua did for, um, goodness gracious, why am I thinking of, for Dummy for Theology, had to think of there a second, uh, on his logical 
uh, fallacies that he's doing for the channel right there. And I disagree with some of what he says, but for the most part, I think he makes some pretty good uh, applications of not falling for that fallacy. So keep that in mind as we're going through this. Pastors and other leaders of the church must deny themselves if they ever wish to worship and serve God. For this part of the test, Aaron failed utterly. But God still will have mercy on him while also remembering how Aaron sinned against him. God does not forget. The forgive and forget principle does not exist. That is a human invention to make us feel better about ourselves. No, if you're smart, if you're shrewd, if you're wise, you will remember when people sin against you, just as God does. Not to hold it over their heads and lord it over them, but to remember, hey, he lied to me. It's possible he can do that again. Oh, she stole from me. It's possible she can do that again. So maybe I'm getting a little uh, tighter around my money and finances if she's around or if he's around. That's called being smart. That's called being shrewd. God is shrewd. God is my, wise. God is smart. So he knows when we screw up, we're likely to do it again. He forgives us if we ask for it, but he doesn't forget. Now, you may be asking, like, did everyone in Israel, were they all part of this conspiracy? Uh where are the other true believers at? Because we know there's some among them. Joshua was with Moses, so he's exempt from the charges of apostasy. But what about Miriam, Caleb, uh, Bezalel, and Oholiah, who were just praised in the last chapter, by the way, uh, amongst others? I mean, simply put, we don't know. But we can speculate based on their characters. Now, no person in the aforementioned group is perfect. Moses wasn't perfect. Joshua wasn't perfect. Miriam, Caleb, Bezalel, and Oholiah weren't perfect, but they stand out because they have or will lead the people in worshiping God later on, yet their voices aren't mentioned as being ones who spoke up against the crowd. Did this mean that they gave in to the same peer pressure and worshiped the golden calves? Oh, yeah, calf could, could very well be. But for some of them, the likeliest story is that they spoke up and were silenced by numbers. Meaning they were blameless in all this, but we can't say for sure. Maybe because they were younger, they fell in with everyone else, made a mistake, had to repent of their sins. We don't know. The answer is we don't know. I prefer to think that they spoke out against us, but I can't prove that. So I'll leave that to you as we move on to verses 7 through 14. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods of Israel who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Ain't that the truth? Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation out of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn, against, burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. We see here that God's righteous anger is raised by his people's apostasy. He has every right to act as jealously as he does and would have been just to start over with Moses, as it would still fulfill his promise to the patriarchs to make a mighty nation out of them. But he didn't follow through with his wrath. Why? Because Moses spoke up for the people and God is merciful. God didn't change his mind. He's immutable like that, but he allowed his primary representative on the earth to do his job, unlike his brother Aaron, 
and allowed Moses to advocate for the sake of the people. Can we get an amen from Moses here? He did what he was supposed to do. Unlike his faithless brother at this time, Moses stood by his job, stood by looking after the people, caring for the people, being the intermediary between them and God. God is right. They deserve death. But Moses is right, too, to speak to God as he does. The nations would have mocked God for destroying the very same people he just saved. And it would set back God's plans by hundreds of years. The nations were already going to mock God, so there was no reason to add fuel to the fire, and God's plans were never to annihilate Israel, save Moses, so there was no reason to do that, because any other group that came from him would have acted the exact same way. How do I know that? Because people are people. Even if that happened, God's will still would have been done, only delayed. So Moses prevents this by speaking for the people. Had he not, Israel would have died, save for him. But this didn't happen because they had an advocate. They had someone speaking on their behalf to save them from themselves. Other than those who pray for the sake of their church and the people within them, we have such an advocate in Jesus Christ, working alongside the Holy Spirit to save us from God's righteous wrath. In 1 John 2, verse 1 in the CSB, it says, My little children, I am writing you these things that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. That's part of Jesus' job, is to make sure God doesn't give you what you rightfully deserve, even those of us who are saved, as if we're some, somehow better than other people. Yeah, yeah, sure. My ticket to heaven is there but I'm not better than anyone else. I'm still just as sinful if I'm not careful, if I'm not on top of things. So when I screw up, God can decide in his mercy and in his wrath to cut me off for right now so I can be in his, he in his heavenly place. Or Jesus can intervene and say, remember he's yours. Remember he's ours. Give him more time. Let him repent. I know he can do better. I know these people can do better. They're going to screw up. They're going to sin. But if we give them time, they'll repent and they'll come to you. I don't know about you, but that brings me immense comfort to know that despite my many, many acts of rebellion, sometimes even in the same day, Jesus is speaking up there as my advocate to say, Lord, not yet. Spare him. And even if he says that and God allows me to be harmed, if God allows me to die, he's just because I deserve far worse. And yet he's holding that away from me because of his son, because of his sacrifice. Now we see at that same time, for those of you who covered Romans with us in Romans 8, 26 to 27 in the KJV, it is written, likewise, the spirit also helpeth our affirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth that what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God, because of them, because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we have constant support even in the midst of our sins and transgressions. The Spirit is helping me say the words I need to pray to God that I can't even understand. God, help me for this. Help me because of this. Help me. I, I've sinned against you. The, the Spirit is acting as an intercessor between us and God to make sure that we aren't unduly represented before him. Lord, yes, he has sinned, but he also gave his life to you. Spare him. Spare her for now until their day has come. Both of those are beautiful things we do not deserve. We don't deserve Jesus, number one. We don't deserve the ability to be with the Father. We don't deserve the Holy Spirit working with us as he does his job. And yet God has given all of those to us. And we'll go from there to verses 15 through 24. 
Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, in his, in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back that were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's the noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. (laughs) Ah, yeah, you got to love it. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. (laughs) You know, the Bible's really funny if you actually pay attention to what's happening. Sometimes you let people, you ever talk to that person who is so full of themselves and you recognize the dumb things that they do and they don't even realize it. They think that they're wise and you just let them speak. Like that's what's happening here. Uh, alongside Moses forcing them to drink, <laughs> drink the water with the the remnants of the calf in it. And they're like, okay, uh, you want the calf? Well, I'll make sure you have the calf inside you. It's ridiculous. But we see here, Moses shares God's righteous anger. And then does something productive with it. His anger doesn't turn to hate, but remains an act of love by proactively removing evil from the midst of the people. So too are we called to act when it comes to protecting the truth and love provided by God to us. We are called to fight against injustice and and heresy in their many forms, regardless of the person who speaks and acts within them. There is no place for evil and false teachings to exist within the church. It must be purged so that the body can grow healthily. This applies to everywhere, but really should apply to the church. Really should apply to the church. Because if the church isn't a bastion of truth and love and good teaching, we're screwed. Because it's definitely not in the world. All you have to do is listen to any politician speak, is listen to any CEO speak who doesn't know Christ, and even those who do and allow themselves to be taken by the things of this world. There is no Jesus out there. So if there's no Jesus in the church, we are screwed. Now, so some of you won't like the language I'm using there. That's fine. You can argue with me all day long. My point remains. Without him, we suffer. Without him, we have no hope. So if we're not doing our job to make sure that this evil is purged from our midst, we deserve exactly what happens to us. Now, Aaron, on the other hand, continues on with this cowardice and instead blames the people for the decisions he made. Now, obviously, we decry Aaron's actions, but how do we avoid the same things in our own lives? By remaining sober-minded, and being held accountable by trusted people who are looking out for us as we look out for them. Anyone in any position within the church, from the pastor to the newest member, must never blame others for their own actions. It is never the fault of another when we sin. We choose it. Yeah, there's temptations other people can throw at our feet, but who made the action step to commit that sin? We did. We had the opportunity, we've had the training, and we know how to resist those temptations, yet we chose to do it anyways. Any sin, doesn't matter what it is, lying, lust, greed, what have you, we know better. We need to deny ourselves and stand up for the truth, regardless of how people view us or what they say and do when we support truth. Aaron failed at this at this time. But we can learn from it by resisting that failure. And we'll wrap up things today by going through verses 23 through 35. It's going to be 25 through 35. 
And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The next day, Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf the one that Aaron made. This is one of those parts of the verse. Maybe you've heard this preached before. And maybe they skipped over this part. Because, well, this gets a little too real. It's... So it's, it's not very loving of God to do this. It's, it's very, very harsh, don't you think? No, I think this is tempered. I think this is far less than what they deserve. I think this is merciful because death was required here at this moment. The people have sinned and blood needed to be spilled. God cannot let this go unslighted. He needs to respond to their actions to let them know it is not acceptable what you are doing. It is, in fact, evil what you are doing. So as punishment, some of you aren't going to make it because you let your hearts be swayed by evil, because you would have brought disaster to others, because you would have destroyed my people from within with heresy, with evil. Aaron, as we mentioned before, was spared for now because God had promised that he would lead the people. But the other ringleaders and head apostates were slain. Aaron's time would come far in the future, but before he could enter the promised land, which is a consequence of his sin. Could you imagine after this, serving Israel as faithfully as possible for 40 years and still not making it in? Well, it's because of what happens here. It's because of his temporary apostasy, which, hey, every single one of us, are guilty of temporary apostasy at times, yet God is merciful and faithful to allow us to live far beyond what we deserve. And so it was true of Aaron as well. So you think, well, that's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> Who do you think we're dealing with? Once again, if God were fair, we'd all be dead the instant we had our first sin. If we committed our first sin, knowingly doing it, we'd be gone. But God is unfair. And that is good for you and I, because it means we have a chance to live. Now, we look at this slaughter and are horrified, but not always for the right reasons. Loss of life is always tragic. There's a human being there. There's an image bearer who is dead now. But sometimes that image bearer must die for the sake of the good of the people. We don't want to live in a world where our Ahabs are in charge where our Hitlers are in charge, where our Mao Zedongs are in charge. They don't deserve life. Heresy and poor leadership has no place in the church. In the same way that no doctor worth his salt and is capable of removing cancer from a patient would tolerate its existence in them, so too are we to treat sin and heresy in our midst. If you have a good doctor who's actually, you know, some types of cancer is just unfortunately grown too far. There's nothing we can do. That's not the doctor's fault. It's a doctor's fault when he says, well, yeah, you got this little batch over here. It could grow and become, you know, stage whatever. So I'm going to leave it alone. That's a bad doctor. A bad pastor, a bad leader in the church would do the exact same thing with sin in their midst, whether that be from themselves or with members of the church. Now, I have wrestled with this idea for many years. Because this is easily the swiftest way to handle evil in the church, yet we are also called to love and forgive others by Christ. So how do we handle a growing group of her her heretical teachings in the church? Do we just slaughter them all? 
do we exile them, excommunicate them? Or we say, oh, you continue doing what you're doing. It's fine. Jesus loves you. All those answers. I mean, there's no easy answer here. I'm not here to give you an easy answer because I don't think there is one. Because some days I really don't want to do ways, don't want to do things the way we've been doing them. Like, how are we supposed to handle this issue now? Do we need to restart inquisitions and burning heretics at the stake? You know, some days, if I'm being honest with you, I wish we did. It's certainly cleaner and more effective, but it's not always good. But at that same time, there's a reason no one follows, very few people at all, would follow the opinions of the Cathars, the Arians, or Pelagianism anymore, outside a small group of cultish kooks, because they got wiped out for the sake of believers in Christ in the world. Yet, it becomes a very slippery slope, as sometimes the church needs to change and false charges can be levied against more reformatory groups, as happened in the Protestant Reformation. So I temper myself and caution others to do the same instead of calling for radical theologies and ideas to be exiled from your congregations so that you can remain blameless. I wish there were an easy answer to this. I wish it could just be, well, kill them all and let God sort them out. I don't think that's what we're called to do. Outside of very specific circumstances, I'm glad the Cathars aren't around. You want to talk about some kooks? Ooh, listen to what they have to say. But should that be how I react as a future leader of the church? I'm guessing most of you would say, please no. And I would agree with you for the most part. But there has to be a response to this evil. And it cannot be to just say, oh, well, Jesus said to love them, so I guess I'll just leave them alone. No, you have to challenge them. You have to get them outside of the church, and they have no place there when they promote evil amongst you, when they promote false ideas amongst you. So where's that happy balance? I don't know. I'm not looking forward to when I have to actually do that one day, because guess what? As a leader of a church, that's just something that's going to happen at some point in time. But I do hope to be around a group of other fellow believers who are as serious about this as I, who will counsel me, who will tell me what needs to be done so that we can work together and then me making the final decision and acting. It's something that needs to be done. And once again, I take no pleasure in the loss of life here. It doesn't make me happy, but it needed to be done for the good of the sake of the people of Israel. Now, in all this, God himself had ample reasons and opportunities to wipe out his own people, but he didn't. Instead, he allowed Moses to make sacrifices on their behalf, which they didn't deserve. However, those whose names weren't written in God's book, which that I'm not going to go into detail here. It could be the book of life. It could be a separate book. We're not entirely sure. That's its own thing. Forever from now, when we get the revelation, maybe I'll pick it up again. Suffice to say, there are people in God's book that he can blot out at any point in time who don't deserve to be in glory with him or have proven that they will never be in glory with him. We don't know the fullness of what is being said here, but regardless, what truly matters here is Moses' heart for the people, as he wishes that he can die on their behalf if it means they aren't removed from the book. As, but he can't, because he's not good enough. God denies this because Moses, while loving and well-meaning, can never cover their sins as a sinful man himself. Even with this very noble sacrifice, Moses isn't good enough, but Jesus can, and he did for all those who choose to receive his gift of life. Let me leave you with that today. After all that horribleness, there is something positive here. Moses, a man, was never good enough. Me, even if I said that, and I would believe, I would want that to happen. God, take me instead of them. I would suffer hell so that they would be safe from it. I don't have to, because Jesus made that call for us. He was good enough, and we are covered by that blood if we repent and turn to him. Guys, thank you much, very much for listening today. Had a very fun time with these chapters. Uh, please get a chance to leave a five-star review in your podcasting platform of choice. Just to help us with ratings there. If you're interested in my own fiction writing, you can find my works at starvingwriterskill.com or on Amazon by searching for the name MC Ashley. If you're all interested in some further solid studies into the Bible and its teachings, then check out the other members of the NSL Ministries Podcasting Network. You can contact me at Let Nothing Be Podcast at gmail.com. As well, you can also find me on Systematic Geekology, Why I Don't Like, uh, Friday Night Frights, and some joyful noises later on. 
I'd like to extend a special thank you to Joshua Knoll for the editing that he does and for the music he adds to the podcast. And with all that in mind, God bless you on accordance to his will and not mine. And allow me one more time to remind you, let nothing move you. Hey guys, are you interested in podcasting but don't know where to go? Well, check out Zencaster.com and go ahead and make an account there and use special promo code Let Nothing Move You, all caps. That way you can get 30% off of your next deal to go ahead and set things up so you can figure out how to edit stuff using Zencaster.com to host your stuff to get things done there. So check out Zencaster.com, use special promo code Let Nothing Move You. All right, see ya.